Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to him in order that they, he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word and may we put your word into practice now and always. Amen. Bruce Larson tells a story that he heard from his daughter. Her sister-in-law is a conservationist and one day she and her husband and their young son were driving up the coast of Florida on vacation. They noticed a sign that said, Nature is Camp. Being a conservationist, the lady made the assumption that this was a naturalist camp. So they decided to stop in and have a look. They parked the car and they headed towards the beach. The lady and her husband quickly realized that this was not a place to view things of the earth in their natural environment, but was in fact a nudist colony. This realization hit home when they came upon a group of people all stark naked riding their bicycles along their beach. Their six-year-old son stopped dead in his tracks. He pointed at what he saw and he said, Oh my goodness, Mommy and Daddy, look at what I see. No one is wearing any safety helmets. <laughs> there is something absolutely wonderful about children. The way they think, the way they act. The way they view the world is precious. In scripture, Jesus saw that uniqueness and he told his disciples, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter into it. This is one of those scriptures that we all know and love because we rely on it and it affects us differently throughout the whole of our lives. We loved hearing this scripture as children because as children we felt included. It was a story that we could relate to. We love this story as we get older because it shows the depth of Jesus and his patience and understanding. And as parents, grandparents, we love this story because nothing is more precious to us than our children. So this morning I want to take these four verses and see what insight we gain into their meaning. This passage is important for our relationship with Christ for two reasons. First, we get a glimpse into what kind of person Jesus was while he lived on earth. And second, we are given a command from Jesus that will greatly benefit our faith journey. Now, what we notice here about these verses is the time frame in which they occur. It was customary during this time period for mothers to bring their children to be blessed by a rabbi, especially around the time of the child's first birthday. The disciples probably figured that this was yet another group trying to get something out of Jesus and their inclination was to protect their friend and so they were ready or they tried to send the children away. <coughs> also at this time in Jesus' life at this encounter, he was approaching the cross and he knew it. The Pharisees were turning up the heat trying desperately to discredit him. His disciples were displaying a severe lack of understanding of what was going on and everyone was wanting all of his time and attention. Things were becoming tense. The disciples must have sensed this. They may not have had a complete understanding, but they knew something was going on and things were changing. With all of this that was happening, the obvious thing for Jesus to do, the expected, the apt, the understandable course of action would be for him to withdraw and regroup. But Jesus made himself approachable and in this instance insisted that the children get to come to him. 
He was a man who made time to be with children, to laugh with them, to sit with them, to hold him in his arms, and to bless them. This conveys to us that Jesus was a man of faith, for he knew how to trust God. He was a man of kindness, for he knew how to love others. He was a man of joy, because he was open and he was approachable. He was a man of love, because he always put others' needs ahead of his own. He was a man of compassion, for he always knew when others were in need. And he was a man of conviction, because he did what was important. So why then did Jesus say that all of us need to receive the kingdom of heaven as a little child? So the scene is that as the mothers were bringing their children to Jesus. He welcomed them. He spent time with them. He blessed them. He did what was expected as a, a rabbi. And he, in fact, went far beyond what was expected with how he engaged with the children. But why not stop there? Why this quote that says we have to be like children to enter into the kingdom? Why was this a teachable moment in Scripture? Well, I think it's because Jesus knew that for our lives to be where they should be with God, we need to have the hearts and the behaviors of little children. Now, there are four childlike traits that we as Christians need to possess that we learn from our children. The first is a child's humility. Children aren't born with pride or prestige or wanting to be the very best. They are taught that as they grow up. They are taught that by others. They are taught that by a society that teaches us to be number one and to strive for perfection. Now, if I was in a room with about 10 or so adults, or if I was to dress all of you here today and say, listen folks, I need help in drawing some pictures for a publication that we're going to do to promote the church's holiday events, how many of you would stand up and say, sure, let's get to work? I would more likely hear from you, no offense, but I'd more likely hear, I can't draw, I'm too busy right now, you should ask Jim, he's a great artist. And my says Jim, and we actually have a Jim here who's a great artist. That works fabulously. <laughs> um, and if I was to say to those same adults, there's a new choir starting, and we could really use your help, who would like to sing and be part of the choir? Do you th I, I, I do not suppose that all of you would stand up and say, let's go show me where I sign. I would probably hear things like, oh, I can't sing. Oh, I don't sing outside of the shower. Oh, singing is not my gift. Or, trust me, you really don't want me to sing. <laughs> but if I went to a group of children and said, who can draw, who can sing, all the hands would go up. I can draw, what would you like me to draw? I can sing, what would you like me to sing? I would have many eager assistants ready to honor my, my request. That's because children have a special kind of humility. Their goal is to please and help, and it is so strong that they have not yet learned failure or embarrassment or pride or the importance of self. That is the humility that Christ wants from us. One that is focused so much on the good, it doesn't see the other aspects that tend to get in the way. Now next, Christ wants us to have a child's obedience. Now we have all seen, we have all had, we have all been that unruly, that tantrum wielding, that need to be sent to the room child. We see them a lot in grocery stores, never in our own home, but in grocery stores and other places, we see that unruly, disobedient child. And to put the words child and obedience together almost is oxymoronic. It's like saying jumbo shrimp. And, and I have to read you, because I love oxymorons, natural makeup, paper, towel, and my favorite, Dodge Rant. <laughs> and although children uh, can misbehave, and it does seem like an oxymoron to say a good or obedient child, it is in a child's nature to be good. Ch ch children want to obey. They are looking for that structure. They, they don't want to cross that line, and they want that line clearly defined. 
And that type of, a, of obedience is important with our relationship with Christ. Because as we grow up, we become more aware of our sinful sight. And it becomes harder and harder to stay true to ourselves and to God. So being obedient to God, to our faith, to doing the right thing becomes a daily struggle. That is why we need that childlike obedience, that passion that wants to follow the rules, that passion that needs structure, that passion that is determined not to cross over the line. We need that childlike, uncorrupted will that seeks to please, to serve, and to obey. The third quality we need is a child's trust. We all know how important trust is to our relationship. But a child's trust is different. A child trusts his or her parents unequivocally. Children trust us to care for their every need. We feed them. We clothe them. We entertain them. We relieve their pain. We pick up their pieces. We give support to them in times of grief. We provide with them shelter and security. We make them feel safe. We instill in them values. We build up their self-confidence. We teach them about faith. We demonstrate love and we guide them to independence. It's the kind of trust that looks past ignorance, that cannot see the bad, and that still believes the best in others. It is a trust that produces hope, a hope that provides endurance, and an endurance that shows unconditional love. It is the kind of trust that God shows to us and the kind of trust we need to display in our lives with our relationship with Christ. When we can let go of our own reliance, when we can have that childlike trust that God will care for us, when we treat God like the loving parent that God is, when we live our lives with that complete childlike trust in God, then we know God will never leave our side nor let us down. Now the final childlike quality that we need to convey is a short memory. Children quickly forget the bad and they are so apt at remembering the good. A little child can readily forgive and willingly forget. Their memories are short, which means their hearts are full of warmth and their spirits are full of kindness. As adults, our problem is not always in the forgiving, it's in the forgetting. We tend to remember the hurt and the betrayal and the terrible things that were done. But little children say sorry so quickly, they say it's okay when we say sorry because they do not know how to criticize or hold on to grudges or nourish that bitterness or they don't know yet how to get even. Their spirits are pure and their hearts are unblemished and they are quickly moving on to the next thing. We need that childlike memory. We need to forgive, we need to forget, we need to move forward. Now there is a poem by Dorothy Law Nolte. She was a, a writer and she was a family counselor. She wrote this poem in 1954. And in 1954, it was widely spread. I don't know what that means today with the internet and everything else, but it was something that she wrote that became very popular. And I need to, uh, I, I can't memorize this, I need to do it the way that she intended it to be read. But it's called Children Learn What They Live. If children live with criticism, then they learn to condemn. If children live with hostility, they learn to fight. If children live with fear, they learn to be apprehensive. If children live with pity, they learn to feel sorry for themselves. If children live with ridicule, they learn to feel shy. If children live with jealousy, they learn to feel envy. If children live with shame, they learn to feel guilty. If children live with encouragement, they learn confidence. If children live with tolerance, they learn patience. If children live with praise, they learn appreciation. If children live with acceptance, they learn to love. If children live with approval, they learn to like themselves. If children live with recognition, they learn it is good to have a goal. If children live with sharing, they learn generosity. With honesty, they learn truthfulness. With fairness, they learn justice. With kindness, they learn respect. 
If children live with security, they learn to have faith in themselves. If children live with friendliness, they learn, the, they learn that the world is a nice place to live. When we see things through the eyes of a child, we are much better and much apt and much more in tune with God and how we live our lives. And we get that wonderment, that innocence, that ability to be proud of the things that we do like we do in our children. There was once a boy, and big surprise, his name was Bobby, and he was in the backyard one day and he decided that he was going to practice his baseball. So he gets his bat and his ball, he stands in the backyard and he says, I am the greatest hitter in the world. And he throws up the ball and he swings and he misses. He doesn't hit a thing. Now, being not discouraged, he does this for an hour. He does this thing where he says, I am the greatest hitter in the world. He throws up the ball, he swings, he misses, he can't hit a thing, and the ball falls to the ground. And after about an hour, he is not discouraged. He is not daunted by the task in front of him. He has an idea. He knows how to make him the greatest that there is by simply not saying that phrase before he hits the ball. So he takes the ball and he throws it up in the air and he swings and he misses and he says, I am the greatest pitcher in the world. <laughs> that is the simplicity and the innocence of a child that we need to have in our relationship with God. That trust, that obedience, that kindness, that short memory, all of the things we discuss, we need to be that for God so that we can serve God in this world, so that we can be there for other people and our children. That trust that, you know, we're in the midst, it's, it's not so bad here because we're away from it, but other parts of the country today really are suffering. And, we, and, and, and I've known from being with you of the 600 members of this church, 532 go to Florida at some time during the year. So I know we all have a connection. We have friends there. We have, we have wives there. We have relatives there. And so we come and we see something like this and we hear others say, why would God let this happen? And why would a good God do this? And so on and so forth. And we need to pray for those people. We need to have that childlike trust in God, that God knows what he's doing. And God is going to put us in the right situation at the right time in the weeks ahead to really help and to love and to help those that are suffering through this time. And we can do it with that child like humility and faith. So let us pray. Gracious God, help us to be your servants. Help us to be your children and to display those wonderful qualities that will help us help others, now and always. Amen.